Today we're talking about when things go wrong. How do we deal with failures? What's actually stopping us? And how can we be better at dealing with them? Resilience is the key word here. So welcome to the Imperfect Clinician. And Mike. And today we are discussing about resilience to failure. Yeah, so we want to talk about what happens when things go wrong. So before we expand on it, what do you think resilience is? Well, resilience as such, when I try to research it here and there, it's the capacity to uh, withstand or to recover ideally quickly from difficulties it's a sort of a function of toughness or it's a measure of toughness rather so i like to see it as how you recover from sticky situation okay um so when you have a failure or when you've done something wrong usually i call those sticky situations which means they stick to you and how the skills that you've learned to remove the stickiness is what I would call resilience. So if you are in the starting stage of building resilience, then things stick with you for much longer. And then if you have practiced more skills in building resilience, then you have the skill to remove the stickiness sooner or quicker. So like you said, how to recover quickly from difficulties. So this quote i i really like it says it's from yasmin morgahed she said resilience is very different than being numb resilience means you experience you feel you fail you hurt you fall but you keep going i think before we do that i think it's important for us to understand that resilience or failure in itself plays a role in our life well it does play a role in our life and we are uh, genetically uh, conditioned to respond to certain stress factors in our life and it's a part of uh, human conditions because we are wired or our brains are wired in a way that we always want to venture on the safety part of the equation so we usually overestimate the threat um, because that kept our predecessors to stay alive they didn't want to um, feel so much courage that they're going to jump into in front of the lion they had to venture on the cautious side rather than anything so we want our brains are created in a way that we make big things out of little things and we hold on to that negative outlook of the situation or experience and we also overlook those positive ones because those positive ones we feel like they're like um, a given um, and we don't pay that much attention we don't draw enough of our attention to it so our ancestors back in like i don't know in a cave somewhere who faced daily predators they in order to survive, they had to be cautious. They had to assume the worst uh, outcome of the situation rather than just jump into, and it is a, it's, it's how to preserve your, uh, your life, how to preserve your safety, how to preserve the survival future. Survival skills. It's a survival skill, yeah. So what, what happens when you make a mistake? Because one thing is to, to understand how we approach the uh, problem, how our biological sort of predominant are already uh, sitting in us, but then the reaction to it, I think it's worth exploring a little bit further. So what happens when you make a mistake? Have, um, you, have you made any mistakes you want to uh, tell me about? I have, but I think I want to share something that um 
stick with me for quite a while and I had to it took me longer than I would have liked to recover from it and that's when I first received a complaint about myself so this was um, a patient who was not happy about me not removing but reducing the pain medication so sorry I should say not the patient him or herself it's the family member that's not happy that that was being done even though the family member is not being part of the conversation so the conversation has always been myself and the patient and it's always been the shared decision however the family member that was involved was not aware and felt that it was done without any prior discussion so a complaint was lodged and that was my first complaint and I took it very personally I felt that it was my problem I felt that I maybe could have done better could have communicated better and that was a steep learning curve for me okay so how if you were to describe I don't know, three feelings that accompanied you um, when it happened. Maybe before you reflected on it and, and maybe a bit later. I would say shock, then shame, and denial. When you're talking denial, does it mean that you understood what was the problem? So denial came from in this case, it can't be. Why? Yeah, so this is the thing. I, I feel that when we feel denial, when we can't fully understand from a different perspective the situation that happened. Yeah, and I can't fully accept it yet. And so that was an yeah. instant reaction instead of a, a day later. But instantly, of that course, was and you have absolutely right to feel whatever you know, whatever comes to you, you just mm. feel it. That's 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 what happened. So what um, what happened next? So what happened next was I had to respond to the complaint, which means I have to do some fact finding and write something back. However, before I could do any of that, I had to be calm. I had to find ways to calm myself down and this in this case I left my room to go and make myself a cup of tea so I thought removing myself from the situation from my room really helps so to gain the distance yes think, in, yeah. in some ways in order for me to try to have emotional distance I tried using physical physical distance or actually remove myself from the room and in that case I link the room to the situation remove myself from the room and go and make a cup of tea so that's similar to what we we're talking in uh, the first season when I said that I want to sleep things off yeah there's a problem in a way yeah yeah mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes that helps sometimes it doesn't sometimes I need to do more than that so now I've built a toolkit of such so either leaving the room or go and speak to a supportive colleague or go out for a walk these are the things just to clear my head I think these are the things I find helpful to help me gain a bit more clarity in the situation and then I go in and I try, and then I go back in my room, and then I try to deal with the complaint by fact finding. So, so I try to deal with their emotions, and then let it simmer. So it's not rearing its head right in front of me. Let it simmer, and then I fact find. So discuss, uh, find out what actually happened all throughout. To, to approach it in a more methodical way, trying yes. to. So we want to discuss it in a little bit more methodical way. So we're trying to disintegrate 
different components of it just to see right what was the discussion what was the outcome, um, outcome? my notes yeah. ev everything else <clears throat> so i go into sort of private investigator mode and then look into each detail based on what i remember but most more importantly based on what i wrote and the other part is also all the conversations are being recorded so there is always evidence of what's being said. Okay, so you were already prepped to it in a way because you put some safeguards in place before that happened. Yes. So you have a good uh, structure of recording the conversation that took place, mm -hmm. evidencing all the things. So you had something to work on. That, that, that's, I think, quite precious to see in a clinical setting. Yeah, I think for all clinicians, um, safety netting making notes the consultation notes all of that are really really important because i don't know three months down the line three years down the line you wouldn't remember every single conversation and having those safety reels or safety nettings are really important it's great that you say it to the patient but it doesn't count if you don't record it and write it down so note taking is very very important on top of the recorded conversation so this is to provide you the no sleepless night policy that we discussed in the first episode yes of this series um okay so how was the how did it impact you in for the next conversation about similar subject or you know any other what impact did it have on confidence or decision taking how 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 did you learn? What what did you learn? I think confidence is definitely it for me in this case. I find it's only normal for you to have for me to have a knock on confidence to feel that maybe my communication with the patient was not very clear. Um, maybe I should have done more. And this was the thoughts in my head. In in this case for. The, for the for the complaint sometimes it's resulting in me speaking to the patient sometimes it's me speaking to the patient and the patient want me to speak to the family member so it differs but a lot of the self-doubt usually happens in my head before i am able to do anything else so i think for me the biggest learning is to address those gremlins in my head Okay, so what support did you did you need any support from anybody else or from um, or do you feel like you could all you need to do is just work it, work with it yourself? So I think f for me it's both. It's I needed to work on it myself, but I also need the people around me. So I feel during that time the words or the weight of other people's word carry a lot more weight it creates a bigger impact because i feel more vulnerable and in terms of help so in the healthcare system the national health service in the uk there is some mental health support to um to clinicians and if you have a complaint you are being triaged because the risk increases in regards to suicide. So study shows that when a clinician has a complaint, increases the risk of suicide. So, so wait, so this, this is very important what, you, what you're saying, because I've, I've not been really aware of this. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the impact can be so significant on the clinician. Yeah. And that it can lead to really dramatic consequences. Yes, it does. Okay, so is there any need to let it out? I don't know, put it into a discussion into the public to to try to understand. I mean, obviously people have got a lot of valid complaints and there are problems with um, medical practice in in every sphere of uh, healthcare. 
But I think it's important for people to understand what impact it has on the clinician, on the individual. On the well-being of it. On the well-being of, yeah. And I think this is especially a good opportunity to shed a light on the importance on the well-being of clinicians because the clinicians are involved and directly responsible to a great extent the well-being of the patients however what system is in place to support clinicians with their well-being and i think part of the reason why i wanted to raise it here is because the well-being of you every single one of you that's listening is important not just because it affects you but it affects everyone around you the impact can be very severe um, both ways positive and negative yes okay so let me, let me tell you my i remember my first mistake mm. um, when i was a young pharmacist many many years ago but i remember it as vividly as it happened this morning it wasn't particularly major in terms of the consequence of it and there were others later on that had greater impact but this was the thing that it happened as soon as you think that you're invincible as a young clinician and of course you realize that you don't have a thing you miss uh, you don't have experience but you feel that you are confident enough you're okay to to work as a you know, qualified clinician. Mm. I remember, I remember, uh, well, I let past the prescription. I checked the prescription for anti-epilepsy medication for carbamazepine. It was the modified release that I let go instead of the immediate release tablets. Mm. And I found out about it from the patient who came in and said that I'm not feeling very well after taking those tablets. I've been taking it for a long while and I froze. I was listening to it and I'm looking at the box that what brought to me it had the, obviously the correct label on it, but the medication was, was given wrong and it just froze me. I, didn't quite know how to respond. I didn't feel prepared. I, I think I was aware that the things like this will come because we all make mistakes. Yeah. But I wasn't prepared for it. I think I was prepared mentally, but I wasn't prepared emotionally for, for that. And probably that's the reason why I still remember it until today. I can hear the patient saying, I wasn't feeling very well. I could feel a little bit more drowsy. I could feel, you know, not myself. And luckily nothing major happened to the patient. He didn't have a fit, didn't bang their head and didn't die or, or anything mm -hmm. more severe. But the fact that you can make this difference by a, by a wrong decision or by a bit of absent-mindedness, I mean, you know, you you just need a fraction of a second to change the medication for, for example, for a month for a patient or for a few months or for a few days or for a dose. And I'm sure that impact on the person or the idea that started to grow in my head on the impact on the patient to say that, well, actually now I need to make sure that I need to do more to provide that safety people rely on you because people don't are not expected to know things about their medical conditions about the medications about the treatment so they rely to you so there is an additional responsibility on it and ever since then and it was many many years ago i always open carbamazepine box to see what color tablets are <laughs> <laughs> because the immediate release are white and the modified release are beigey sort of color so it's not I, even easy to di differentiate yeah but but you know i always now just check and do it by the color no matter yeah. what happens i just want to convince myself that you know and this is one of the things that we do to minimize the risk in the future this was the lesson learned mm. but 
I still remember being frozen, stood in front of the patient, and not being able to respond to it in a way that I can do now. I wasn't equipped to it. And I think that the knock-on on your future decisions, on how you approach it, you can never get used to it. I mean, me as a, as a clinician working in healthcare, I can never get used to making mistakes. And I don't think there is a lot of clinicians in any capacity that can just, oh, well, and not care. That's not how we are. It's not in our genes. Do you know what I mean? That, that's something that always sticks to us. And building resilience, it's something that is a way of a natural progression of us as a clinicians to become stronger. Yeah, and I want to go back to when you say you think you've prepared mentally but not emotionally. What did you mean by that? Uh, what, what I meant is I knew it was going to happen mm -hmm. and I knew that what you need to do is to first check whether you know the, the, the patient's okay, making sure that the patient is safe and make sure that you, I don't know, follow the procedure for reporting the incident and work in action plan. So I was, my my brain knew what actions should be taken. What you needed to do. What, what I needed to do, I needed to, well, you know, look at it and I knew that I needed to reflect on, I knew that I needed to put an action plan in my head as well as in the organization that I worked in. But what I wasn't really sure is how I'm going to respond in the real world situation. It's not always you get surprised by something like this for the very first time. Yeah, there's, there's always first time. And how did it make you feel emotionally? Vulnerable. You feel the weight of the decision, so you understand the importance of your role. And I think. A bit scared. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. because you that could have been something much bigger. Yeah. That could have been something that would have been life changing or life ending. Yes. That's that's something that is present in our everyday practice. And so how do we go forward? How do we build the necessary resilience? Because the things go wrong and you have to assume, in my opinion, that they have to go wrong. Or do you? I think having the emotions really helpful to almost relate to that situation. I wanted to see how you then spoke to yourself after. Was it a lot of self-blame or was there... Yeah, there was, of course, there was, there was blame. And there was uh, guilt that I didn't conduct the due diligence to provide the safe outcome for the patient. Mm. Because even if you're like, I don't know, medication checking pharmacist or pharmacy technician or the, the amount of decisions that doctors make in a day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you multiply it by the amount of, I don't know, items or decisions or process that go through it, the chances of us being wrong or making a mistake is really, really low. Yeah. I mean, you, we have to understand that, that if you work in a relatively busy pharmacy, for example, here in the UK, and if you take out the holidays or whatever days in a year, you still would check, I don't know, 100,000 items a year easily. Yeah. Okay, so that this is easily what you're checking. And so in making, those 100,000, you are actually making the clinical decision each time. Not absolutely. just prescription, but the patients that you speak to. Mm, absolutely. You also discuss, you provide advice, you, yeah. I don't know, deliver a service. Yeah. And, you know, there is 100,000 essentially situations when the things can potentially go wrong. Yeah. And what we need to understand that the percentage of us essentially being wrong, I don't want to, you know, big any, you know, any professional group because nobody wants to make a lot of mistakes in any, exactly. any capacity. But if you're making, you, you can have a one decision per year that's going to be really bad and it's going to be affect all mm. the other almost 100,000 decisions. Mm. And I think it's 
those situations they stick to you that's what you said that they are yes. sticky and i quite like how you describe it as a sticky situation because they sit with you and you have to deal with them no one else can fix it for you no one else else can heal it for you you are affecting other people and other people's well-being and it's i mean it's not only in healthcare you know if you have a bungee jumping facility you also want to protect your yeah. your clients do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, definitely. That, that happens in, in so many areas around us that it's not exclusive to to people in healthcare but i think it's you feel guilty that something could have happened you feel shame you you shame yourself by right am i worthy is it something that is going to just cross my well career or starting career or career in the full swing or whatever and like you said earlier on life changing rather than career changing mm, that's the thing it impacts others health it impacts yes. others well-being and it impacts another person directly it's not something that you drive into somebody's car and you scratch it you hurt people and i mean natural thing for us is that we don't want to hurt anybody. Exactly. I want to say for for most people, shall we say. And I wonder what happened to your self talk when you had to deal with a mistake done by somebody else because that somebody else is not here. I well, first of all, you want to make sure that nobody's hurt. Okay, you want to make sure that what happened, whatever the mistake happened, uh, didn't impact anybody's well-being or health, especially didn't impact any longer-term situations. I don't know. Patient wasn't hospitalized. Patient didn't, you know, drop off bungee jumping road rope. Can I be honest? I do that, but also at the same time, I'm very urgently checked whether I was involved. And then if I'm not, I internally breathe a very big sigh of relief. Or I think I'd do it later. Do you do it later? I, I, I think I'd do it later because I think I get so uh, directly involved with the patient because you are effectively the person that is taking the complaint, the, somebody coming with a mistake in directly to you that I don't really have time about thinking. I'm trying to fix it, uh, remedy yeah, the situation, yeah. so you, you problem put things solve right. First. And I, th I think the setting's a bit different in your case. Patient actually comes to you and bring you the error. And in my case, I have a combination of either that or I get a call about the mistake mm. or the complaint. And so I'm able to fact check. Uh, of course, I make sure patient's okay as well, but also whilst I'm fact checking, I'm making sure that oh, it's not me, okay, let's solve this problem, but with a bit more distance from it. Of course, it, uh, if, if it doesn't directly impact you that you weren't part of the causing the problem, it, it ultimately, you know, gives you a chance to have a big sigh later on. But I think I feel for any clinician that I'm working with that it could have happened to, because ultimately we're all on the same side. We want to yes. fight for people's well-being, you know, making sure that people are better after seeing us than before. And I think it's quite important to show the empathy to the patient mm -hmm. and try as much as you can, of course, to put the things right for them, to minimize the impact or inconvenience to the patient. Because sometimes, you know, it might be just a minor inconvenience, yeah? But it's still an inconvenience. It's still you let somebody down. And I think it's the feeling of letting people down collectively, okay? I feel for other clinicians. I feel for doctors that I work with, errors. I feel for whoever is involved in it. I don't know, dispensers, anybody. Mm. And I feel as a part of a wider group of course individual i might not be involved in it yeah. but we all care for the same patients you know the yeah. patients are coming to me and i can i i am the first line of contact for the patient when they come into 
to make a complaint, to show us the error, show us the problem. They, we are the first line, and I feel for any clinician that it happens to, because it's never our intention. So I wonder how is it different if you then spoke to the person that made a mistake? How would you break the news? And how would you guide them through it? Oh, this is a longer discussion about giving feedback <laughs> to some extent. Yeah, but uh, highlighting a mistake is, I think, the most difficult part of feedback. Because the, the feedback can be on behaviors, can be on attitude that is transient. You know, you may not feel very well at a time. You may yeah. be, you know, absent-minded and have Many an attitude factors. snap at someone, you know, yeah. this is it. But here, this is zero-one situation. An error happened, okay? Yeah. I think it's quite important to be, it's very important to be open and honest about it and discuss it in a very transparent way. I think that... Way. Constructive is one way, but I think the clinician that you're speaking to has to has also responsibility on accepting that uh, that feedback. And I think that we may not be ready for it mentally, or I don't know. When you, know. you say we, you mean the clinician that's made the mistake? Us, as all clinicians, that because I'm also putting myself in a position, right? Who, what would have happened if somebody came to me and said, "You make a mistake," other clinician? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, being open and honest about things means that you still have to be quite diplomatic on how you do it. You don't want to knock anybody's confidence down. And I wanted to highlight, I think, the language here. Would you have used the same words? that you've spoken to yourself in your head when you've made the mistake compared to somebody else? Would you have used in the same language or would you have been kinder? I would have been kinder, definitely kinder. When I'm talking to myself, I, although I, I, I don't think it's particularly unkind when I'm talking to myself now, knowing what I know after many years. So first is, right, is anybody hurt? Okay, you answer that question. Then, what happened? I want to have facts. I don't want any cotton wool around me. What happened? I know what the consequences would be. If somebody just tells me, right, you did this, that, and the other. So I know what consequences. First of all, when you know how the patient is, then you start to unravel it. And I, when I'm speaking to others, I don't know what they expected me to do, but just to be honest, yes, I always try to be kinder, a bit, <clears throat> to provide a bit softer landing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because you want to work in a supportive manner. You don't want to, right, you've done that wrong, fix it. That's not something that I would do. I would say, right, something happened. We need to, you know, have a little look at it and take it from there. And how would you practice that on yourself? I think now after many years. And after we talked about shame and guilt. And after we talked about shame and guilt, I, I would do my best to avoid thinking that, oh my God, everything is wrong about what I'm doing. I want to look at the problem rather than at myself. Yeah. Of course, you want to learn from it, and you have to touch on the fact that, right, what have I done? Because this is the feeling, that, that's the emotion that comes into you. But if you are a bit trained and a little bit more resilient, I think it's where you start to understand, right, this is not a defining moment. Yeah, this is a drawback. This is a setback. But... Talking about resilience is impossible without failures. Exactly. And I think this is where this is where we need to uh, think about how how do we build resilience when things go wrong. And I think it's then important for us to explore the model of resilience. Of course, there'll be lots, but I think the one that relates is the three P's model of resilience. So it essentially 
um, started by the psychologist Dr. Seligman. And you mentioned about personalization, pervasiveness, and permanence. So when you hear personalization, what comes to your mind? I think it's about myself, what's happened, what, how did I personally respond to it? Like, I don't know, my feelings around. Mm. Is, that, is yeah. that what he means? And I think, so he's trying to say that the belief that we are at fault okay, and taking it all on personally. And sometimes, a lot of the times I should say, it's not just you. It's a combination of factors. It's not. So when you take it on personally, it, it can be very tiring. And the other part he mentioned about pervasiveness. So if something bad happens, it seeps through every part of your life. So let's say I've made a mistake. You then take it on personally. I am a bad clinician. It becomes I'm a bad person or I'm a bad mum in other roles that you hold so it you seeps through all of that and you start shaming yourself and the other part is permanent so you think it's going to stick with me forever mm. i can't ever get rid of it get rid of the feelings well, but when you when you say that i always i and it's sitting with me all the time pretty much when i had a phone call from work i don't i i still can't shake it off no matter what what happens? I don't know. It's a habit or something. When I had a phone call from work, I usually ask, what have I done? I want to get the <laughs> bad news out first, even if I haven't done. Because this is what you say in the permanence. You know, when something happens and then you are badly affected by it, you, you start to realize that actually something can go wrong. And it can go wrong. You know, it could have happened a while ago. Maybe now you're in the top form. You feel great and rested but maybe something happened when you weren't that feeling that great and it comes to you after i don't know patient left hospital after you've made an error for example and i don't think it's just you because but is it habit is it insecurity it's habitual perhaps in the healthcare setting because usually it's similar to when we say to patients if it's bad news we'll give you a call if it's if you don't hear from us it means everything's okay yeah we always say and we always no say that so and even when i was saying to a few of my colleagues, come to my room, um, I've got something. And I was actually have some gifts for them. But the second they opened my door, it's like, what have we done wrong? Mm. Is it bad news? Mm. And I was but like, no, it's not. It's, pre it's actually presence. They're like, oh. <laughs> you, you don't ex you always assume that's what we go back to the biological setting that we always assume uh, things going wrong. Do you think as clinicians, we are just anticipating the inevitable? I want to say sometimes as clinicians, especially for myself, I feel that if I think of the worst case scenario, I am more prepared for it. Okay. But it doesn't, in the long run, I find that it really stresses me out because I'm always like fight or flight. I'm always on the edge thinking something bad's going to happen. And it takes a lot of practice so then for when the things go wrong so are we prepared are we always assuming that the things will go wrong so when you say are we prepared i want to say you will be prepared or you'll be more prepared if you work on the resilience part of it and if you don't then it sticks to you longer i have to go back to my analogy because i really like it um I like it too. And yeah, and I think when we talk about what resilience consists of, different things, I think those are really important. So when you say whether we are prepared, we can be even more so when we work on those pillars of resilience. Okay, so how do we prevent burnout? Because if there is a lot of challenging situation grinding on you and you can't really... Uh, manage it in a way mm -hmm. you're going to inevitably head towards the vicinity of burnout yeah yeah do, or do you, so, what do you do so if i start by expanding what i feel is the four pillars of resilience and then we can touch into burnout is that okay yeah go on so i find for me 
and when I've been reading a few or quite a few other people, self-awareness, self-care, community and compassion. So self-awareness is understanding your own reaction, both physically and emotionally. So for some people, the palms get really sweaty. For some people, they get really flushed. It's understanding your own reaction, so that's the physical side. The emotion, so how would you react to it? Is your, like you said, is your first response blaming yourself? Are you shaming yourself? And understanding your own strengths and weakness. What is there around you? The next is self-care. So when you talk about burnout, I think self-care is really important. So that includes your eating, sleeping, mindfulness, things that you nourish yourself with. So you have that, imagine a seesaw. So you have the problems and you have the self-care on the other side. And if problems becomes the majority of your life, not just problems, but tasks that you have to do, whether it's complaints, whether it's mistakes, and you have minimal self-care, that's when burnout happens because your body don't have time to reach that equilibrium or that balance. And then community, straightforward. So that is support network. So I use, I sometimes go to people around me when I mention supportive colleagues, they're there to be a voice of reason or they will be the other part about compassion. They will be a compassionate voice when I sometimes struggle to find that for myself. So you said earlier on, it's actually easier to show compassion to others and actually harder for myself. So I think these four, I find it's really important to be aware when you are stretched and be aware when you're reaching burnout. So when we're going back and we want to link in with the preventing burnout mm -hmm. by finding time to relax yes. and looking after ourselves, mm -hmm. are the problems with resilience due to the fact that we care more about others than about ourselves yes <laughs> to, okay, to, so some, to some extent let me let me expand on that so i think that can be multi-layered when you put other people's need above yourself and we mentioned it in season one where you find that your self-worth is bottom of the list so you don't prioritize yourself but it can be also your it reflects on your ability to set boundaries to say this is what i need I'm going to say no to you or to the request or to whatever that's encroaching on my time. Okay, so do we, these are just questions for, for you, for me and for, for the listener. Do we give us enough time to recover or to relax? Do we know when to ask for help? Because that's an important factor as well. Yeah. The, and, when you mentioned, do we give enough, do we give ourselves enough time to recover? and to relax. To recover, not sure, because I don't know whether you feel this way, but when I am unwell, I have to be really unwell to, go, to not go to work. And if I do, I do feel guilty. And I think, and I think, and I think this is the same regardless of what role you do in healthcare. Mm. When I speak to other colleagues, um, when they are off sick, they are really, really unwell, like maybe off with COVID and all, even with COVID, still feeling guilty about having some time out. Mm. And what about setting our own expectations of our, I don't know, response to things when they go wrong? What I mean, just to clarify it, is for example, how often do we think about failure? Is it like a... Um, stopping block preventing us from progression i think it is possible especially if you take it personally and you think it's going to last you become very risk averse do you think it's a it's a function of volume so the, the more stress uh, stressful situation or is it the the weight of them well i, I suppose it's both but what I'm, what I'm really trying to find out that how do we prevent those situations becoming stopping blocks in your, you know, in progress of your career? 
So I want to use the three piece that we mentioned and then turn it round. So besides what we mentioned about those four pillars, understand the impermanence of it. So the mistake that can happen will affect you, but it wouldn't stay forever as it you would fail feel on the spot there and then. And the pervasiveness of learning to have that distance. I made a mistake, but I'm still a good clinician. I've made a mistake, but I'm still a great person. So it's a, the action that we need to work on. There's nothing that reflects the character. So having a distance from that and personalization is accepting that sometimes, like you said, somebody might be unwell, somebody might not be at top form, a glimpse of an eye, something distracted you, and accepting that we are human. 100%. What about building the team resilience? When, you, when you're looking at the support, or the community support network, mm. How about, uh, how do you build resilience of the whole team? Because the problems, they affect us personally, yes, when we make a clinical decision or managerial or leadership decision. But what about the team? The team is impacted as well. I agree. I think building your own and your team's resilience will in turn improve organizational resilience because organizational resilience is consist of flexibility, learning and adaptability. And with any small or big organization, you can't escape the culture, the structure and the strategy. And who makes up organization? People. People. So when you build those people's resilience, so individual and teams resilience, you are improving organizational resilience does it make sense yeah yeah i mean yeah so we i think we sort of agree on the fact that resilience can be built when things go wrong but can can we build resilience without facing failure oh i i don't think so i think failing really helps to build resilience so the more we fail the more res resilient we become and then the more we grow because when we address failures, we have a deeper understanding about how we react, why we're doing things. So we shouldn't be avoiding failures. We should be learning or focusing on recovering from failures. Yeah, if we're avoiding, then we're sort of jeopardizing our work in a way because yeah, and it's, a it's skill. inevitable that Re you're going to come across challenges exactly and the re resilience is a is a skill you need practice without without having the opportunity to practice those skills then it's not as sharpened and i think it happens when we face something that we cannot change that's the sort of um definition of resilience i mean we only build on failures that we cannot change so some things already happened and there is little we can do to fix it so we can just mitigate it i guess mm. you know um one thing that we can do is to learn from it and use it as an opportunity for for growing uh, uh, definitely I, I think we need to respect our potential for mistake in this context, I would treat it as a vulnerability. Yeah. Okay. So going further, we need to be challenged to grow. And how do we ensure we do not take on too many challenges? This is about the setting the barriers that you mentioned before, yes, I believe. Yes, definitely. Uh, because that can be overwhelming. But mm. By building resilience, we increase the bandwidth and also the capacity for coping with them. I think every mistake... Or, you know, when you discover a potential mistake, yeah. it, it leads to a tiny step of growing, of learning, of becoming a better clinician, leader, manager, whatever role you want to position yourself, parent. Yeah. So I think that the success does not test us. It doesn't provide enough motivation, enough impulse to build the resilience. But my dad always uh, used to say that 
you always have to be resilient, not only to failure, but also to success. And I think in this context, it means that you just need to stay humble. If you're doing great things on your uh, path, on your professional path or in career, and you're making a difference, you're making all the right decisions, you still have to assume that you are not... Um, a know-it-all. Yeah, you, you're, not, you're not a know-it-all, you're not an oracle. You stay and grounded. there's always a potential for 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 learning. I yeah. mean, we, we're talking about being resilient to success as well. If you win the lottery, how resilient are you going to be to the, well, success? Well, not yours particularly, okay? Yours was a bit of luck and being the right time in the right uh, space. But how do you become resistant to it? How do you remain cool-headed in the face of not only a failure, but also a success. You know, you just need to make sure that you work on yourself in whatever the circumstances. So, so the outright conclusion is, we have to keep working on ourselves. <laughs> exactly, and I like Nelson Mandela's quote. He said, do not judge me by my success, judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. I completely agree with uh, Nelson. <laughs> uh, you, uh, another question, probably how, about dealing with, with failure. Would writing down failures have an impact on the way you deal with it? Would it help? I don't think it would particularly help me personally. For me, instead of writing down failures, I write down how it makes me feel and I try to ident identify where it comes from. So for, for me, writing has always been positive because if I am deep in it emotionally, I feel that my brain's very foggy and I can't really mm. put it in a structure where I, I can comprehend and slowly process. So for me, the, the writing helps. It's a it's a tool for me to break down, right, I feel I don't know, not listened to. I feel angry. Why do you feel that way? What are you afraid of? And keep asking myself that question. And then when it's clear to me, then I can work on it. So writing has always helped me. Well, for, for me, writing, I think I would find it too slow. I think I have things, um, I solve things faster when I'm thinking about them, when I'm, I don't know channeling it in a different in a way in a different direction I, for yeah. me writing is not it's not like for example we sometimes tell kids oh just write it down scrunch it up and throw it in the bin get rid of your emotions i d that does not work for me i think things stay with me in my head for a little bit longer but it doesn't stop me from from going forward i mean i do like problem situation. I think I'm quite competent in handling them. I agree. You you have a reputation of being very good at conflict resolution. I am quite. I think it becomes a skill when you have very um, conflict generating parents, <laughs> <laughs> and and you have to deliver what you need to say in a way that's going to be diplomatic and i think diplomatic doesn't mean dishonest for me yes and i think you have way more practice than anybody because of that so you had to start really young and you had to practice so many times so again as a skill you become so good at it but the other part about um you mentioned about writing so writing works for me, doesn't for you. For some people, it's, I don't know, cooking, mm. making music, going for a walk, just sit down in the blanket and hide and think. It, there's so many ways, just finding couple, at least a couple or a few ways to work for you. Maybe for us, it's recording a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that in the future, we're going to look at other things that impact our dealing with failure all we want is just to put some questions in your head i mean we don't have all the answers we we have our own experiences and maybe if you 
find them relatable, that would be always uh, um, good to let us know. A good to good to let us know. I will also always remind you that when you sign up to our podcast, you have got a chance to listen to something <laughs> very exclusive. Yeah, so go on our website if you if you haven't done so yet. Uh, we've subscribe, done something. Yeah? yeah, subscribe on our website. Put your email. And we're going to surprise you with some exclusive bit of content that we created together. A bit less serious than all this proper divagation we do <laughs> during our episodes. And yeah. Hope you're able to listen, reflect and rise. Thank you all for listening. Until next time. It's about time for you and Reeds. Welcome to our new segment of You and Reads. Today, I'll talk about a book that I have read and made lots of notes and still go back to it, which is called Play by Stuart Brown. So if you follow us closely, you know play is still something that I try to incorporate in my day-to-day -day activity. Because I, because I'm somebody who likes to plan things ahead, including play. So this book really stressed the importance of play because it links to creativity. And not only that, it really helps, I found, nourishes the soul. So this for me is a strong reminder how to incorporate play so the notes that I've made on the sides are how does it work if you're a parent authentic play and protecting your creativity properties of play and six steps of plants I like plants as you all know um different personality of play and I I think when I try to do this I, I learn from the children as well because children is the best place for me to learn about play I guess for everyone um, and so I'm hoping that I go into parenthood or now that I'm in it I see it as both a learning journey and also a type of play. So I love playing with kids. Um, when we have kids over, I'm, I'm the eldest kid, essentially. Um, but it really relaxes me and I get really good rapport with the kids and they always come and talk to me after or when they come again next, they'll come and find me because they know I'll engage with them. So, yeah, it really helps me make a conscious decision I guess to take on a more playful attitude and addresses some of my fears and insecurities I guess because a lot of a lot of place making emotional contact with people and it's quite easy to be defensive and be inverted commas proper so I'm trying not to be proper all the time because it's quite boring and quite, what shall I say, quite stunted in some ways, I guess. You just listened to the Imperfect Clinician podcast. We strongly recommend you leave your email on our website so that we can let you know directly about any news and free exclusive content for subscribers. If you review us on Apple Podcast or Podchaser, there is a chance we can reach more people seeking support and encouragement. Reflect on how you are now and let us know about one thing you would do differently after listening to us. We'd love to hear from you, so please keep the questions coming via direct message, email, comment or record a voicemail on our website. We will do our best to answer you either directly or via the podcast. Bye for now and until next time. Yeah.